podcast system. Had this been a real podcast, you would leave edified and entertained. Welcome to episode one of season zero of the emergency podcast system. I'm your host, Pete Cantillon. I'm based in Morden, Manitoba, Canada. For those of you who don't know where Canada is, take out a globe. We're the second largest country in the world. Thanks for listening to the first episode, which was really episode zero, kind of a test episode. If you listen to it at all, if you didn't, that's fine too. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, investigative reporting. And, uh, you know, it's an area that's always been of interest to me. This podcast series, uh, whatever it turns into, is going to be one thing, and that is broad, and, uh, and, and it's going to touch on a lot of different subjects. So there's not really going to be a lot of a theme to it. If that's not your thing, uh, that's fine. But I'm just warning you uh, in advance that there's not a lot of continuity. It's got you know a little like uh, Star Trek: The Original Series. It's very episodic. Every episode's theme is going to be a little different, and I'm probably going to be a little different in each one. Maybe we'll get some guest speakers at some point. Um, we'll see where this all goes. In the meantime, mostly it's just about me doing a brain dump on things that pop up from time to time. We'll try to do it weekly. So this week's title, The Investigative Reporter, is subtitled Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill. Now, I got to tell you, I just listened to uh, the audiobook version of Catch and Kill. And, and by the way, I highly recommend audiobooks. I was pretty skeptical uh, for a long time of audiobooks. Uh, being a hardcore reader, at one point I I think my library had over 700 books, and uh, I'll be honest, I hadn't read every one of them. I'd skimmed a lot of them, and read most of them. But still, I you know a bit of a bookophile, and or bibliophile, and um, uh, and and so I like the written word on page and paper. I like the texture, the feel of it. Uh, as a writer uh, who has seen his work in print, uh, there's just something about. Uh, uh, holding it uh, and uh, and and feeling it and even smelling it, the scent of a newly printed paper or magazine. There's just something unique about it, and uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, and so, audiobooks had always struck me as kind of lazy. But then I got a job in Winnipeg that saw me going into Winnipeg three days a week uh, and commuting, uh, giving me an hour and a half in and an hour and a half back. And there's only so much talk radio and music I can listen to. So I caved and I started listening to audiobooks. And I did the research because I, I still, I felt guilty. I'm like, this, is, this, is not, this isn't a good way to consume information. But I, I did some research. I saw some peer-reviewed papers. And, and it turns out that audiobooks, uh, the way our brain works, it fires the same areas of comprehension and understanding in our brain uh, that uh, reading visually uh, a, a book uh, on paper, a bound book, does. Uh, and so the amount of work and effort and comprehension involved uh, with an audiobook is very much the same or similar to uh, a paper printed version. So that alleviated my guilt and I dove in. The um, and I've listened to uh, you know a few. I'm catching up on the Dune series. I've got three library cards. I'm borrowing one from a friend in Georgia. I have a library card in North Dakota. I can't tell you how I got, and a local library card here in Morden. So that gives me three options on Libby, the app I'm using to check out books. And uh, and and on occasion, it's still challenging to find a book because it's just like going into the library. Uh, if the if the audiobook is out. Uh, or they're all copies of the audiobook are out. It's you know they're not going to make a billion copies. They have license agreements, 
and you they only have so many they can distribute. So if, if you don't have it, you put it on hold and you read something else. So I finished up the um, Wheel of Time series, 14 books. I didn't read the prequel. Sorry for fan people out there who don't believe that's completing the series, but it is what it is. Um, just finished book five of the Dune series. Uh, read, listen to Night by Elie Wiesel. I highly recommend that. We'll probably do a separate podcast just on the subject of the Holocaust and uh, and uh, modern implications of that. We don't want to get into that now. Uh, but I uh, have just finished uh, Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill. And I have to tell you, if you are interested in investigative reporting, either as a consumer of the content or uh, someone who's uh, a writer, a journalist, or interested in being in journalism, Catch and Kill is, in my opinion, a textbook on good investigative reporting. If you're interested in writing and understanding investigative reporting, you have to read this book. You know, uh, I think I've become a bit of a fanboy uh, for Ronan Farrow. And he is... He's accomplished a crap load in his uh, uh, so far relatively young life. He's got his just completed his doctorate in I think uh, global politics or political science. Forgive me if the research is thin on these podcasts. They're, you know you can dig this stuff up easily uh, if you want to fact check what I'm talking about. I know he's just completed his doctorate in the last couple of years. Uh, ever successfully defended his thesis and um, and he has his law degree uh, he's been a reporter for NBC and uh, the New Yorker and of course he's written numerous pieces uh, for all kinds of different organizations but catch and kill uh, what that focuses on is the investigative work the grunt work the leg work all the hard uh, uh, tasks that he had to string together over a fairly uh, long period of time uh, to investigate allegations uh, that were proven to be accurate of sexual assault or in the US the, the parlance uh, legally they still talk about rape um, against Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, uber powerful, um, super producer, uh, founder and owner, co-owner and co-founder of the Weinstein Company, Miramax, uh, notable for some pretty substantial, significant releases, Lord of the Rings among them. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a running, and it's a sad one, a running joke uh, these days um, that everybody knew uh, Harvey Weinstein was a scumbag who was abusing his authority in Hollywood as a producer. Uh, he was using his authority and his power to um, entrap uh, women, actors, pr actresses primarily, but women in the entertainment industry, uh, into uh, circumstances where they were uh, sexually abused and raped. And, uh, and he got away with it for years, and there were a large number of people around him uh, that enabled and allowed this to continue. Uh, and, and not just people, but organizations, uh, corporations, news agencies, NBC among them. Uh, it's remarkable the amount of information uh, that Ronan Farrow was able to, to dig up as an investigative reporter. And I'll have to say, as a reporter in general, I would describe Ronan Farrow's work as high journalism, if there is such a thing, if you can call uh, you know, if there's a genre of journalism, uh, he writes fluidly. He is incredibly smart. It comes across uh, in uh, his writing style. And he doesn't descend uh, too often to depths of, uh, of street-level uh, journalism. Uh, he's uh, in the sense of uh, the kind of parlance that he uses. I mean, you really need to, uh, you know, he's understandable. It's, it's just... Uh, that he's not he's not uh, he's not a reductionist in the way he presents his information. Um, you know, uh, another who I would call 
you know, a fantastic journalist who's also done some amazing investigative pieces was Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, not a lot of people think of Hunter S. Thompson as an investigative journalist, but he certainly did all that work. Uh, notably, his first major work, Hell's Angels, uh, was definitely an investigative piece. But he inserts himself into the into the piece in a way that uh, few journalists can do. And um, and also, it's not what I, I wouldn't call Hunter S. Thompson high journalism. Uh, and this is not an insult by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that Thompson's approach is very stream of consciousness um, and very uh, street level uh, in terms of uh, understandability and uh, how he presents information. And and so, Farrow, on the other hand, again, I mean, his intellectual skills, his uh, his uh, and his his knowledge shine through. And of course, the work that he's he's done. So um, Catch and Kill really is phenomenal. Now, as an audio book, it's great because it's also narrated by the author. Uh, and it's, a, it's quite the thing to listen to Ronan Farrow put on about a dozen different accents as he seeks to uh, accurately reflect the voices of the people around him uh, as he's gone through this process. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the, quite the journey. Uh, I'd be curious to know what Ronan Farrow thinks of his own performance as the narrator, but it does lend something uh, to the experience of uh, of the book Catch and Kill. And it was Ronan Farrow's work as an investigative reporter initially trying to build this story for NBC and NBC pushing back because of its own corporate ties at the executive level to, uh, um, uh, to Harvey Weinstein uh, that eventually led him to leave uh, and uh, and take his work in, in uh, effort, continue it with the New Yorker, which was brave enough uh, to publish the piece. Uh, and it's phenomenal. It's, uh, like I said before, it's a textbook example of how to do good investigative reporting. Now, an investigative reporter is taking on the task of digging deeply into uh, a story that, uh, impacts people at some of the most powerful levels. Uh, often an investigative report is uncovering a truth that one or many people, organizations, or both are seeking to hide. And they're hiding it because the truth is uh, uh, that people are being hurt or have been hurt. Uh, an injustice has been done and, uh, and there are people or organizations, powerful or otherwise, uh, that would um, suffer uh, if that truth were to come out. The value of investigative reporting is that it holds power accountable and it brings and magnifies and amplifies the voices of people and victims, primarily, uh, who have been uh, or met with, uh, been under or the crush of or met with injustice of all kinds. When I was a young reporter working for the uh, Ottawa Citizen, I, you know, the closest I got to it, any, any investigative work, I wrote a piece on a small company called BrickGuard in the 90s. They were offering aftermarket add-ons to uh, consumer vehicles um, as, um, uh, anti -lock, as an anti-lock brake system. So anti-lock brakes were relatively new in the early 90s. And, uh, and, and this company was capitalizing on that by bringing in older vehicles that didn't have an ABS system and then and performing uh, some work in the sense of uh, they created a module that then uh, dealers, manufacturers, and uh, mostly garages could uh, install into vehicles that, and claimed that it offered the same sort of benefits as an anti-lock braking system. Uh, but really what was going on was the module was just bleeding pressure from the brake line. Uh, so your, your, bra your, your brakes couldn't lock up because they just weren't braking effectively. Um, and, and that's a far cry from intelligent ABS systems and what they do. In fact, it, it was uh, uh, potentially uh, incredibly risky. Uh, so I got to write that piece with the enormous help of of the uh, editors at the Citizen, or guiding and kind of mentoring, shepherding a young journalist through the process. 
And you're talking to people who have experienced the, um, you know, whatever the subject matter of the investigative piece is. In my case, I'm talking to people who had had the system installed and then afterwards had uh, encountered dangerous circumstances, uh, reaching out to the organization that is marketing the component and uh, trying to get a better handle on, on their side of things and, and why they are claiming what they're claiming. Uh, you know, that's part of the work of an investigative reporter. Another piece I wrote was on the uh, a community reaction, local community reaction to news that a, a mosque was going to be built in the eastern uh, suburbs of Ottawa and Orleans. And, uh, and that it was a relatively negative reaction from the community and there were some efforts to ensure that the mosque uh, would not open. Uh, it was more of a masjid, uh, which is kind of a prayer house in uh, Islam. Uh, and, and the extent of any investigative work was really just getting at the bottom of, of the community, um, the community reaction, why uh, the negative uh, uh, concerns, uh, digging into the stereotypes that existed, and uh, of course getting some reaction from the people who were trying to open up the mosque and, uh, and, and what they were looking to do. So it's a little investigative, a little bit more of a reaction piece and certainly doesn't go through nearly the efforts uh, and the amount of time uh, and work that Farrow put into his, uh, his piece for The New Yorker and ultimately how he chronicles it in Catch and Kill. I have to say, um, you really do need to read it. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about it because, I mean, you should read it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the investigative reporter uh, is, is really uh, a critical... Um, part of what what it means to be a journalist uh, and gets to the heart of the values of journalism. These days, journalists aren't uh, all that trusted. Um, I think there's a cultural movement uh, against journalism, and uh, part of that is being led by our divided uh, society. It's easy to attack truth tellers uh, when the truth is inconvenient. And uh, sometimes we do it to ourselves as journalists. I say we, I'm still a journalist. I write three columns a week for our local, uh, or sorry, three columns a month for our local uh, weekly newspaper. Uh, a columnist in, uh, in a lot of ways operates on, uh, on the same principles as an investigative reporter. Uh, columnists want to, I mean, the best of us, I think, want to amplify the voices of people uh, locally uh, and relating to issues and concerns, issues of equity and justice, certainly. Uh, and to, uh, But the advantage of being a columnist is that you can, you can go out there and ask questions and raise attention uh, to concerns and issues uh, and, and hope that the investigative work is done uh, either uh, by people and organizations or other reporters. It's certainly not investigative reporting, uh, but there are overlaps in terms of the motivations and themes. And that's that's where I've settled in my journalism career. I'm most comfortable as a columnist offering opinion and amplifying voices. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't see enough investigative reporting in rural Manitoba, in small town Manitoba. One of the reasons for that is the the um, consequences of doing an investigative report in a tiny community where everybody knows you, I think are, are, are pretty significant in comparison to writing a piece uh, for a national uh, publication or a large city newspaper or magazine. That's not to suggest that there aren't issues uh, for uh, and risks associated to the investigative reporting of uh, folks like Ronan Farrow. There are. And they are significant. And he goes into some of the uh, impacts that this work had on his life. There were legal threats. There were security breaches. There were privacy breaches. There were very real fears for his own personal security and those of the people in his life. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, it's taking a pretty big risk when you poke power uh, and uh, uncover things, turn over stones 
uh, and especially things that people think have been buried. Uh, when you start doing that, it ruffles feathers. But in the smaller community, everybody knows you, right? I mean, you can't hide. There's no, there's no, um, there's no escaping the eyes of some of the people that you might be investigating. And so it's it's it can be harder for uh, news organizations to want to pursue some of the more sticky uh, pieces, uh, you know. And there's greater pressure from the on the public publishing side uh, from uh, advertisers. Now advertisers aren't told in advance of of publication what news stories are being published. But your salespeople are aware of that. Your publisher, typically publishers are, are salespeople. They lean heavily on the sales side of the organization, the revenue side of the organization, and they can be aware of what's coming. And I have seen, and it's, not, it's certainly not unheard of in smaller organizations uh, to see uh, the publishing side lean on the news side in terms of headline writing, content, and coverage. Uh, and the smaller the community, the more likely that is to happen. All that to say it's a complex kind of a thing to do. Uh, it requires a certain amount of fortitude and a willingness to sacrifice on the part of the journalist as well as the editors and the news organization because the, the, the blowback can be substantial. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, the good investigative reporter in the organization, the news organization that supports the investigative reporter, uh, stands by the truth that they're seeking to uncover. When you find evidence of wrongdoing, injustice, inequity, etc., uh, as a journalist, I think it's your obligation to continue to pursue that, to uncover that, and to ultimately uh, bring that to light. Uh, it holds people accountable when you do that. Uh, regardless of the consequences. Uh, I think that uh, if you choose to ignore difficult things that are brought to your attention, in this instance, if Ronan Farrow, for instance, had bowed to the significant pressure that he felt and stopped pursuing uh, the many stories of women who had been subjected to sexual abuse by this one individual, over a long period of time, I believe he would have been complicit in uh, allowing this abuser to continue and complicit in this historic abuse. Uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a burden that you have to be willing to bear. And, you know, if I want to just end this transition to uh, talking to anyone out there who may have been sexually abused, now, I'm speaking not only as a journalist, but as someone who has uh, been sexually abused for years as a child, at the hands of uh, multiple men in positions of significant authority in my life. And I can say that publicly because I've said it publicly before. Uh, and so I know something of the pain and the shame. I know something of why it's so difficult for victims of abuse to come forward uh, and I will tell you that in me, and I am a journalist, I still have some, um, you know, I still have a bit of an audience. And even with this podcast for the three or four people who are listening, I have a bit of an audience here. In me, you've got someone who will listen to you and will pursue uh, your truth if that's what you want to do. I say if that's what you want to do. Because, again, it took me 30 years after the first instance of being sexually abused uh, to be able to speak about it publicly and then pursue justice. That was really hard. But the unburdening, when you bring that to light, uh, is phenomenal. Like, it is, I cannot describe to you the feeling of, uh, of lightness, and the beginning, the true beginning of healing that happens when you're able to communicate uh, abuse that you've, uh, you've suffered. So I'm just going to end that, this podcast by saying, um, yeah, if, if, if you have a story 
that you need to communicate if if you've been abused by someone in a position of authority i i tell you now even if i can't find the news outlet i will uh with your permission pursue that and i will help you uncover it and bring it to light within the best possible standards of investigative journalism that i can muster certainly now again read ronan farrow's book uh, catch and kill it is a textbook example of investigative reporting it looks at all aspects of it the process the people involved and the personal toll it takes on the reporter as well as on the people who are uh, providing the information uh, so yeah that's been today's podcast this has been a, a broadcast of the emergency podcast system Thank you. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming.